Lameness in the dairy cow is my biggest worry because national statistics show that in any one year about 50% of dairy cows are going to become lame and at any one time over 20% of them are actually in pain from lameness, moderate to severe pain from lameness. Moreover, the pain goes on and on and on for weeks. Food from animals comes from sentient creatures who have the capacity to suffer and who deserve a good life. And that means that when we look for quality in the supermarket, we must build in quality of life for the animal as part of the criteria. And consumers are losing out too. While supermarket milk is still an essential source of calcium, several recent studies indicate that organic milk is higher in other vital nutrients. It's got more omega-3 and we're on average getting not even a third of what we should be having. It's got more um, vitamin E, which helps protect it against um, aging. It's also got more beta-carotene and antioxidants, which protect against cancer um, and deterioration of the eyesight. Um, it also tastes better, so it's more enjoyable. And actually, it doesn't really cost a lot more. We're talking about a few pence difference to have something that is, is so good and more enjoyable. So the next time you go to your local supermarket, spare a thought for the poor, overworked dairy cow and consider the quality of the milk you buy. The supermarkets say they have increased the range and diversity of our food, and that's undoubtedly true. You can eat Mexican, Chinese, you can have uh, guacamole, you can have tortillas, whatever you want. British supermarkets give you it, and we mistake that with appreciating good food at a fundamental level, we don't. They've turned themselves into cathedrals of choice. You walk past hundreds of meters of products, all demanding, calling for your attention, saying, buy me, eat me, consume me. Today, supermarkets stock all sorts of exotic fruit and vegetables, figs, mangoes, aubergines, virtually unavailable 30 years ago. But what about our own homegrown produce? This is the National Fruit Collection in Kent. You know, it's mystifying. There are more than 700 varieties of apple that are native to the British Isles. Just look at them all. And they've all got fantastic names as things like Pitmaston, Pineapple, Green Custard, Bloody Ploughman's, to name but three. Just imagine all that taste and texture, all that choice. So why is it when I go to the supermarket, even during the English apple season, all I see are the same old names? Most of us don't even know what we're missing. How many varieties of apples can you name? Um, I don't know. Bramley apple, Cox, Granny Smith. It's Golden Delicious one. Yeah. Uh, one. <laughs> it's Granny Smith one. Yeah. It's your Coxies. Is it Coxies Pippin? Your French Golden. Golden Delicious, Granny Smith. So why is our choice so limited? This huge depot is one of Sainsbury's regional distribution centers. All the big supermarkets have them, strategically placed around the country. The supermarkets claim to be introducing more local produce, but every day, fleets of lorries pound the motorways, delivering millions of tons of food to the stores. They've got into this mess over 30 years, this huge complex distribution system where you can buy food at your local supermarket and it may be originally was grown by a farmer 20 miles away, but it's trunked up and down motorways before it comes back to you. This is crazy ecological economics, but it happens. The environmental and social cost of all these food miles is huge, nine billion pounds a year. It's been estimated that a typical Sunday lunch travels 26,234 miles. Some journeys simply beggar belief. One Scottish farmer told us that his entire crop of sprouts was taken from the field to a depot, then to an airport where it was flown to Poland to be trimmed and packed, 
then flown back to the UK and sent to various regional distribution centres. Some of them even ended up at the local supermarket just yards down the road from his farm. And it's the ability to withstand all this travelling and arrive in the supermarket looking perfect that determines what's available. Because some varieties simply get travel sick. Take strawberries, for example. Once a longed-for summertime treat, ripe, soft and dripping with juice, now they're available all year round. This is Perry Court Farm Shop in Kent. Now, look, you don't see this in the supermarkets. Picked this morning. No, well, exactly. Can I eat one? Of course you can. <laughs> Thank you. Mmm. Mm. They do taste like... They taste like I remember strawberries tasted. Yeah. Heidi and Martin Furmore used to supply the supermarkets with strawberries. Not anymore. We grew, I think, about ten varieties at the time. Two of them, which we thought were excellent strawberries, but they just didn't want to take them. Um, Why not? I think that, um, they thought, I think, at the time, El Santa was the one, and that's the only one they wanted. In the trade, the El Santa is known as the strawberry that bounces. So we have a duff variety that has been picked and mature. And this is why you have these big, crunchy red strawberries that last for quite a long time, surprisingly long time, but just have no flavour. And it's become ubiquitous in British supermarkets. El Santa. El Santa. Well, it doesn't specify what variety these are, but my guess, El Santa. El Santa. So why is it that we British have such bland, tasteless food, but in Europe it's so scrumptious? I've come to Madrid to find out from someone who really knows. The man who used to run Safeway is now over here in Spain in charge of one of the country's biggest supermarkets. Carlos Criado Perez says we get the food we deserve. So, Carlos, I mean, looking at this, what is the difference between what we're seeing here and what we would see in a British supermarket? Well, I would say that the first thing that, that is a big difference is that you're seeing uh, fruits and vegetables by the season. So, you're not seeing the same products all through the year. Uh, in the UK, you would see a set standard all through the year. The bananas would be there the whole year, the grapes would be there the whole year. You're seeing also, they are not all sitting on the shelves and the soldiers looking all alike. Uh, uh, they are much more varied in shape. They're natural. They're natural, yes. yes. They have more natural. Carlos told me that in Spain, supermarket shoppers just won't buy grapes when they're out of season. And the varieties they just won't buy, the Spanish export to us. It, uh, uh, does it taste different? Definitely. The good number of the seedless grapes that you buy and you sell in, in the UK are made in and, 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 and planted here. But uh, the Spanish market just simply doesn't take it because it goes for taste. It seems British taste buds pay for year-round fruit and veg. I'm absolutely convinced that there is a trade-off between uh, uh, getting you know everything looking the same uh, uh, getting your uh, your product in a way that you can transport it very efficiently uh, making it very attractive and very perfect for the looks of the consumer and the taste uh, there's no doubt in my mind about that the trade-off carlos was talking about became totally clear when i spotted a basket of weird looking green tomatoes now this chap here This is hilarious because he might win a prize in, a, in an unusual vegetable competition. Yeah. There's no way he would be on a shelf in a British supermarket. Not that I've seen, anyway. Well, I, I, I would believe you, but it is a, the best tasty one and it carries a premium here. And it tastes uh, completely different. Mmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is more in keeping with the ones this we're used is, to, the sort of big, juicy red one. Yeah, this is what uh, Spain exports to, uh, to the UK. Mm. That one's much better, the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the little misshapen chappy. Yeah. 